Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar, brought to you by TechStrong and CloudSmith. My name is Cody J. Brown, and I'll be moderating today's session. We have an exciting presentation ahead, but before we begin, I have just a few housekeeping notes. First, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all the discussion, it will be made available to rewatch. You'll receive an email after the webinar concludes with a link to access the on-demand. We want to hear from you, so please send in your questions at any time throughout the program by using the Q&A feature. We'll try to address as many questions as we can, so be sure to send yours in early. I'd also want to bring your attention to the chat tab. This is where you can talk with each other, you can talk with us. So feel free to say hello, tell us where you're tuning in from, or contribute however you'd like to today's presentation. Um, finally, at the end of today's webinar, we will have a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. Stick around to see if you're one of our four lucky winners. But on to the reason you've joined us today. Our topic is securing end-to-end -end software delivery with CloudSmith and BuildKite. And I'm joined today by Kara Carey, Developer Relations at CloudSmith, and Mel Kalfas, Senior Developer Advocate at BuildKite. It is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Kara to get us started. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Hey. <laughs> hey, so I'll start it off by sharing my screen. Okay. Now, can you all see that? Mel, can you see that? <laughs> I can see it. Thankfully, okay. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so today we're going to talk about securing your end-to-end -end software delivery pipeline with CloudSmith and Bill Kite. A few introductions. So I'm Kira Carey. I work in developer relations in CloudSmith. I started working in CloudSmith in May, and prior to that, for over 10 years, I was a software engineer. So I worked on web apps and web services and security products, printing products, and computer vision applications. I've worked with loads of languages and frameworks and tools like NPM, Python, C Sharp, .NET, and C++ of so the vision apps. And now to introduce the lovely Mel, I'll let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Mel Corpus. I'm a developer advocate at Ilka. I've also been there since May. There must have been something in the water. Um, I started. <laughs> Uh, prior to that, I was a software engineer for about five years and worked in software for probably 10 years before that, but in a bunch of different roles. Um, sorry, I was a software engineer and I also use BuildKite in my day job. Uh, and so here I am talking about BuildKite. Uh, I mainly worked as a Ruby backend developer, uh, wrangling event source systems, built JavaScript lambdas and really had a passion for infrastructure and things like Terraform and AWS. It's me. Cool, it's, our backgrounds are kind of similar. We started in software and then gotten into developer advocate, advocacy or developer relations. I think it's given us a lot of empathy for developers and their pain points. And we try to bring that back to product and engineering. So, okay, today we're gonna be covering CloudSmith and BuildKite, uh, tools with developers at their center. We're gonna talk about software development, how it can be kind of hard and there's a lot of burdens on developers. Um, we're, Mel's gonna talk about CICD and CICD with BuildKite. And then I'm gonna talk about package management. And I'm gonna talk about this term, continuous packaging with CloudSmith and how continuous packaging fits into CICD. Then we're both going to do our own little demo. Um, then we're going to open the floor for questions. So let's start by introducing CloudSmith and Bill Kite. So CloudSmith was um, founded in 2016 in Belfast in Northern Ireland, not too far from me in Dublin. So CloudSmith is a cloud native, fully managed package management as a service. It enables your team to quickly set up private, secure delivery pipelines in minutes. CloudSmith is a universal package management service which supports most package formats. So your NPM packages, your Maven packages, your RPMs, your Helm, we want them all. So CloudSmith can be used for development, deployment, and distribution of your software. CloudSmith wants to be the single source of truth for all your software, its dependencies, and any information about your packages. 
and Tysma can help you isolate and protect your teams and customers from supply chain attacks. Now on to Mel's Billkite. Uh, yeah, so Billkite's a platform for um, running tests and, uh, sorry, it's the fastest way to, run, to test and deploy software at any scale. Um, it allows teams to run fast, secure and scalable pipelines on their own infrastructure. Uh, Buildcut was founded in 2014, and they were the first. We were the first CI/CD platform to introduce a self-hosted agent model, which I'll explain a bit more later on. Over the past eight years, we've become one of the best-in-class CI/CD tools, and we now support over a thousand customers and across the world. And we continue to keep growing, which is pretty epic. Um, considering it started as a personal sort of project to solve a particular problem around security. Uh, as engineers ourselves, uh, we understand our users and we spend time working closely with them uh, and our partners like CloudSmith to deliver new features and improvements to the product all the time. Uh, we pride ourselves on being um, up to date with current technology. In fact, last week at reInvent, AWS just announced that we're officially Graviton ready and our logo was up on the big screen. And yeah, so we yeah, so we pride ourselves on allowing our users to access like the fastest and latest technology as part of their build pipelines. Um, so as a CI CD tool, we stand apart as being a little bit different. Uh, and I'll dive into that a little later on. Cool. So um, since I've been in the industry since the late 2000s, there's been a lot of changes in over a short time, only 10 years. And I want to go through a few of those changes and how they've changed software development. So just one slide for all that, geez. But OK, so <laughs> the biggest change in software development over the last 10 years that I've seen has been the availability of cloud infrastructure and that movement away from data centers. It's changed the way we develop software and what we develop. It has driven the use of SaaS products, introduced new software patterns like microservices and containers, and has also introduced new problems like container orchestration, scale, distribution, and security in the cloud. So another issue, not issue, another <laughs> influence has been distributed teams. They've always been quite common in software development, but COVID has really supercharged its adoption, even in small teams. So you don't just get like a distributed team, you get a distributed individual contributor. So devs now need tools that can handle a distributed workforce so that everybody can experience low latency speeds. Tools that don't do this lead to reduced collaboration, developer unhappiness, oh no, and lack of confidence in your software process. Another huge change has been automation and that rise of DevOps. So you might already have be quite mature into your, um, your, auto, your CI, CD software uh, pipeline. Um, and you probably know that adding automation to your software pipeline improves quality, adds your adds um, reduces the build time, and allows your build allows you to build software faster and make builds more reproducible. Developers are demanding good quality tools to help them make uh, to help them automate their software pipeline. Another huge change that is a little bit more recent, or at least the focus on it, has been supply chain security. So all the steps that go, your supply chain are all the steps that go into developing and deploying your software. So your code, your third party dependencies, your scripts, your tests, your IDEs, your environmental variables, even your plugins, your source control repositories, your CI CD tools like Bilkais, and your package repository like Kitesmith. The attack service for software supply chain is just fast. And recent attacks on SolarWinds, CoCubs, and public repositories like NPM and PyPy have prompted efforts to improve the security of your software supply chain. You might have heard um, of this executive order that Biden released about um, improving the software supply chain specifically to open source software. So I think um, software development is quite complicated. <laughs> There's lots of choices to be made on your code, uh, what patterns to use, um, to, to what dependencies to use to build it yourself. And if you are going to use a dependency, what dependency are you going to use? And will that introduce some issues into your code base? 
developers also use a lot of tools and there's been this emphasis on shifting left with quality and security that puts an awful lot of responsibility on two developers. So yeah, the cloud has made like some things easier, um, but also so much more complicated. Like if I think about dependencies alone, I could spend days down the coal mine. <laughs> like it's like, so I mean, yeah, I, I think like the emphasis I've seen is like a shift towards using tools to take care of the things that you know need to be done, but don't want to spend all day doing. So you can yeah. get back to writing code and shipping features. Yeah, let's back to writing code. <laughs> yeah, remember that. <laughs> so yeah, with this ever increasing complexity, uh, we're seeing a whole new wave of tools that are there to reduce this complexity and empower teams to get back on building shop software and shipping it with speed and security in mind. Uh, and tools like CloudSmith and BuildKite can help with that. We both have APIs for customers, our users. We have CLI tools, we use webhooks, and we have multiple integrations with other tools. And also there's an emphasis on really good documentation. And the documentation is, an, is alive and it's adapting to users' needs. When we hear something that's missing, we are always updating our docs um, just to keep things close, close to close to what's happening. Um, there's also the security features that you would expect and want to see in products, such as strong access control and SSO. There's 2FA, event logs, integrations with other security tools and analytics and metrics. And there is quality human support. So just like CloudSmith, um, it's really important to us. We have a support team that is always on deck they are all engineers, they are specialized in the product, and they work really closely with customers to ensure they've got everything set up correctly or working as they need to be. And it's quite a personal touch. It's not lock a ticket, maybe here back in two weeks. These people work quite closely, like they're one of your team. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Like quality support is really important to CloudSmith as well, and it comes from the top. You know, it's important to our CTO, it's important to our CEO, and that trickles down. So what exactly is this CICD that we hear thrown around a lot? Uh, essentially, it's a method to, to frequently deliver working applications to end users by introducing automation into the product development lifecycle. Uh, it, and what is CI, well, continuous integration? Well, that's a development practice where developers integrate code frequently into a shared repository, probably continuously. I like continuously, but that sounds pretty full on. That's like every one minute. <laughs> I'll just say frequently, the FI, uh, preferably several times a day, and sometimes even on a Friday afternoon. Never. Can you imagine? <laughs> um, so each integration is verified by automated build and automated tests and so that any updates are tr trusted and to be working as expected. That's the dream. And continuous deployment or CD is closely related to co continuous integration and refers to keeping your application deployable at any point or even automatically releasing to a test or product environment if production environment if the latest version passes all automated tests. And it's at this point you want your test environment to as closely mirror what is set up in your production environment so that you can trust that when you test your app in staging before deploying that it's actually deployable because we've all probably experienced what happens when that's not the case. And what sort of things could your CICD tool do for you or do? Um, it would be polling for work. It can run build jobs, then they could be scheduled or triggered by manually by users from pull requests or pushes, um, or even when particular branches open a PR. Um, background jobs generating reports, machine, le machine learning model training, so many things it can do. And the most common tasks obviously are running your automated tests, your unit tests, your third party integration or smoke tests, and ultimately 
it should provide dev prod parity for the ultimate developer confidence when deploying code changes. And once that's all done, it would report back the status code or the outlog of the job and also upload, upload the job artifacts to a package repository. I know a good one. And how about, yeah, yes, <laughs> funny that. <laughs> so what are the, some of the pain points and why can CI CD be hard for developers and engineering teams? Um, well, you might have unreliable tests um, we have some staggering numbers on the amount of retries that our customers do. We have like a very handy button that's just like retry in the particular step in CI, but I can't remember the exact number, but it was like staggering. It was something like, was it 60 days of retries across a week or something for like our customers? So that's a lot of wasted time sitting there waiting for tests to pass. Um, some, and I guess flaky tests are defined by sometimes they pass, sometimes they fail, you're not sure why. Um, test fails, build fails, you have to rerun a build that potentially takes 40 minutes. Yeah, Fingers oh, and toes God. crossed, just being well, like... Integration just, tests are the worst, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. <laughs> Always the integration tests. <laughs> um, you might have to spend too long waiting for a build to kick off before it even starts running your tests. Uh, and then when your tests start running, that's it, it's time for lunch. Like I've heard of teams that had to build, like kick off a build and it ran overnight while they were like at home and then they'd come back in. Did it pass? Did it fail? No, it didn't. All right, start again. Um, obviously this was before they moved to build kite, I'll just say, but, um, yes, these are real stories and that is really going to slow down your velocity as a, as a company really. And the end users are not going to get like updates, right? To the software they're using. So it's frustrating. Uh, security teams will be familiar with this issue. And this was in fact, like I mentioned, a catalyst in Bill Kite's origin story, but some CI CD systems, uh, it's not about whether you can isolate secrets and set up granular permissions, that wouldn't be possible, but also some CI CD tools hold important credentials themselves, like they have access to those and also have access to the source code. Uh, and this doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And I guess the biggest one for me and for most developers, I think uh, outside of the infrastructure team is the pain associated with um, speed, the speed of the build, slow. Um, CI CD should be fast. And I'm wondering if you would believe me if I said it was possible for every build to say build in around five minutes. I mean, we could stretch that to 10. I think every it's possible for like literally every build to build in 10 minutes. And I guess that means your architecture should be scalable. So you should have, we have teams that have up to 3000 developers deploying code, not probably not for the same system, the same build pipeline, but you should be able to have your build agents be able to auto scale like we do with our software applications um, to meet demand in shipping. So users and teams need to be in control of the infrastructure and be able to choose what cloud provider to use, make use of things like spot instances, cheaper prices. So whatever is important to the team, you should have control over that, I think, when it comes to your infrastructure. And let's quickly take a look at how CI CD with BuildKite actually works, because I mentioned it was slightly different. Uh, BuildKite has an interesting model and it has a high, it's, co it's coined as a hybrid CI CD tool, um, which actually means, as you can see in this diagram, there's a hosted platform, a bit above the dotted line, and then there's also uh, the I feel like on-prem is kind of a loaded term these days because it doesn't mean necessarily mean physical machines, but it's something that is hosted on your own infrastructure, whatever that looks like. So we host the web interface, the source code integrations, and a bunch of the APIs that you would make use of. You don't need to worry about scaling that part of the system or building UI if you don't want to be building UI, but we do have like GraphQL APIs and things that you can make dashboards and things from. 
But um, there's, and then there's the agent part, which is a bit below the dotted line. And you run these agents on your own infrastructure, whatever that may be, GCP, AWS, physical boxes in on-prem. And using this architecture has big advantages for speed and of course cost. And scaling agents on demand means that you will never have to wait for an agent and you can use really powerful compute. You can have agents on EC2 Mac, Kubernetes, make use of Kubernetes and GCP. The infrastructure architecture is your choice. You can hand roll it with your code, uh, your infrastructure as code tool of choice like Terraform, CloudFormation. And we also have our own Elastic CI stack which um, is a series of CloudFormation templates that you can click a button and kind of spin up auto scaling with ease. So I guess ultimately using BuildKite means you can get any project building in under five minutes or maybe 10, depending <laughs> on how hard you want to work on it, <laughs> but it's possible. Um, and by using our highly scalable hosted platform, um, and having full control over your build environment, you can have true dev prod parity. And because it's on your own infrastructure, you can also deep dive and debug right down the stack if things go wrong. It's on your infrastructure. You have access to all the logs. Debugging becomes a lot easier than if it's a third party CI CD tools infrastructure and you need to wait for them to make changes, debug things for you. So. Um, we've seen people be super happy that they can drill right into what's going on and have ultimate control. And I have to mention security because that's kind of what, what we're focusing on today. But um, because the agents are on your own infrastructure, you can use Terraform or any other infrastructure as code tool with IAM roles, granular permissions. You don't have to give your CI system access to everything. You can use your secret management tool of choice, just like you do in production. And it's worth emphasizing because it makes all the security peeps in the house happy. BuildKite never has access to your source code. We make use of webhooks. And you give um, access via GitHub to BuildKite, but it's more of a, yeah, it's, it's, it's very separate and we never want to have access to it. We just don't want it. Um, you can run each agent queue in isolation, even in separate AWS or GCP accounts if you wish and give them different IAM permissions. And so that's really BuildKite in a nutshell uh, and what our hybrid CI CD solution offers in terms of both ease with the SaaS hosted component and the flexibility of the agent infrastructure you control. And it's kind of the best of both worlds. Thanks, Mel, for explaining CICD. And um, I'm going to start on, on how Bill Kai does a great job of CICD. And I'm going to talk about how packaging fits in and also talk about this term, continuous packaging. So before I go into it, I'm going to explain a few terms in package management. So the first term I'm going to explain is the package, the artifact, or the image. A package groups together your software files, your uh, metadata for that package, and dependencies all grouped together in a well-defined format. I'll explain uh, metadata and dependencies now. So metadata is any information about your package. So who wrote the code, the license type, the package dependencies, and the package checksum. Uh, metadata can also have information about your CI CD builds, like who triggered the builds, the build time, approval information, vulnerability information, or any user created metadata. And package dependencies if, if a package uses or depends on another package, that package is called a dependency. I think, like, almost every project uses third party packages as libraries or frameworks. I saw something. I, I was like looking up a, a stat for this. It was like someone said 99%. I think that was like a bit high, <laughs> but like, let's just say like a lot, most, most, most projects use third party packages. So package manager. So package manager is a piece of software that creates, uploads, installs, upgrades, and configures your software packages for a language container or operating system. Um, I've compiled a little table here of some common packages and their corresponding package managers. So we have Debian here and AppGet. We have Python, um, wheel packages with your pip package manager. And you are um, 
some packages actually have a choice of package manager to use, like Maven and Nougat. Maven can use Maven or Gradle or Ivy. And the reason why you might use a different package manager might be because you prefer the way it configures your package. You might prefer, um, you might get access to um, different feeds or it might be quicker. So there are the reasons why you might use a different package manager. So, and now I'm gonna explain package repository and there's two types of package repositories, a public, a public community-based repository and private package repositories. So uh, a package repository is a place well, for both of them, a package repository is a place where you store all your packages. A community hosted public repository. So many um, is like many languages and containers provide public repositories to host your packages, like MBM, NPM, public registry, or PyPy repository. These community hosted public repositories have, have made publishing and con consuming packages really easy. And this ease of use has made them popular and have really accelerated the development process and the use of open source. It's been great. This is how code is developed now. Most, most projects use open source and I don't see that changing, but it has introduced some security issues you might have heard of, uh, dependency, confusion attacks or typo squatting. So um, the other type of package repository is a private package repository like CloudSmith. So many organizations need a private repository for their packages, for security, for compliance, reliability, or they might need to store many formats because the public ones are usually format specific, like the PyPy only stores Python. On top of that, private repositories provide additional features required by organizations like strong access controls, SSO, guaranteed uptimes, nice integrations with other tools, um, quality support, custom domains or data analytics. Those are kind of the stuff that private repositories will offer. So from this slide, you can take packages are created using a package manager and are usually stored in a repository like CloudSmith. So modern package repositories need to host many formats. For example, CloudSmith hosts over 25 formats. That's like most projects contain a few different formats and it gets, a, it, although they do more or less the same thing, there's a huge amount of variability in the how it's packaged and how to talk to the package manager. This matters less when you're just dealing with one package format, but how about 10? You need an effective abstraction layer around managing that process in a uniform way. Modern package repositories need to be the source of truth. This is always our aim in CloudSmith. We want to hold all your packages, all its dependencies, and any um, any information about your package may be described in the metadata. Private um, modern package repositories need to be easy to automate against. They need to provide CLI and API webhooks and good documentation to describe how to use them. Um, they need to have security features by default, like 2FA, like SAML. And actually, CloudSmith just got ISO 27001 certification, so get it in there. So also, modern package repositories need to manage the problems of scaling and distribution. So we're talking a blend of package management and software supply chain management. <clears throat> So now I'm gonna go into a term that CloudSmith has coined, continuous packaging, to describe this blend of package management and software supply chain management. Continuous packaging is about owning the creation and consumption of packages from end to end. It's central to software supply chain management and, it, and continuous packaging practices prevent you from dropping the ball between CI and CD. Continuous packaging goes hand in hand with the ethos of DevOps practices to automate everything, to build frequently and end to end responsibility of the software process. And CloudSmith want to elevate continuous packaging to the same level as CI and CD because we think it's equally as important. <clears throat> Here, this slide um, shows a possible software um, supply chain using Bill Kite and CloudSmith with, um, with continuous integration with Bill Kite, continuous packaging with CloudSmith, and Bill Kite again, continuous delivery. So if we start from the left here, we can see 
developers commit code many times a day on the commit, tests are run, maybe their third party scanners are run against the code. When those checks have passed, Bill Kite will trigger a build to build this package. So to build the package, Bill Kite needs to pull in dependencies during the build process. Where does it get those dependencies from? It gets them from CloudSmith. So even if, you, um, if you're using third party sources, you set that up in CloudSmith. You set up your upstreams. The dependencies that you use are cached, scanned, and verified in CloudSmith. Brillo, now we have um, our package, which is sourced, which is sources dependencies from CloudSmith. And you can now um, push this build package to CloudSmith. When the packages are pushed to CloudSmith, the packages are scanned for malware. Um, every single package pushed to um, CloudSmith is signed. We can generate that key for you, or you can um, host your key in CloudSmith. And so all your packages are signed using your key. The next thing we do is extract all that lovely metadata that has all that information about your packages. We like surface it. Um, we can, you can search against it and automate against it. And um, this information would be like what we talked about before, who wrote the code, who triggered the build, test that pass or failed, checksums, all that information surface to you to make your, and it actually helps you know the history of your package. We call this the provenance of your package. You can also enrich your packages with extra information using, using universal package tags. So now we have our packages and all its dependencies hosted in CloudSmith, and we want to distribute them. We want to deliver them. And you can, um, it might be for deployment, development, or distribution. CloudSmith believes that package distribution and package management go hand in hand. CloudSmith is a cloud native application built on cloud infrastructure. So we excel at this efficient distribution of software artifacts globally. CloudSmith infrastructure is built on content delivery network, CDN technology. There's over 220 points of presence all around the world. That means that packages and metadata, they can be cached at the edge nodes. And this reduces your need to go back to your primary um, storage location, which might take more time. CloudSmith allows you to configure your edge caching rules per repository, per format. So because our, our CDN is sort of specialized for packages, we have some extra stuff in there for your packages. For example, we do authentication at the edge. So we like to call it like our CDN, we call it a package delivery network, a PDN. So now packages can then be delivered from our PDN all around the world. <clears throat> So adding continuous packaging to your software process isolates you from your third party sources. It brings all your packages, its dependencies and metadata all together in one place to visualize, to control and to observe what happens to those packages. Your single source of truth, which I keep saying. <laughs> continuous packaging means that assets are always traceable, deployable and built in the same way. It's the glue between CI and CD. So yeah, like this is a, such a good like diagram because uh, in my previous role, that center section there on that diagram is the point at which like the build and deliver part would fall down yeah. because we didn't have a PDN um, <laughs> and like we had our own private repository and I think like because we did it, it would like fall over. There was no guaranteed uptime because it was an in-house thing that no one knew how to Yes. And where is it? And how do we get it up again? I don't know. And yeah, also like some, even exactly. just, yeah, we had like our Docker images and Ruby images, like versions that we approved in-house sitting on S3 or some other EC2 repository. And then the, P, the packages would sit somewhere else. And as a software engineer, who wanted to find things. It's like, <laughs> I had to ask every single time. This is so cool. So I know, because I just... you wouldn't be using it like every day. So every yeah. time, you, like I, when I I was using a package manager in my role, and every time I had to like use it properly, like or change something, I just, it was it was like, oh, I hate this. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna do a demo now for my sins. So let's see, okay. 
So I'm going to show you this demo is going to be about how easy it is to use Bill Kite and CloudSmith together uh, in your software pipeline from source control to build. So I have my Bill Kite um, account here. I've set up two pipelines, which refer to my two projects on GitHub, which I robbed from Bill Kite. Thank you, Mel. <laughs> I, I just had to like add in uh, CloudSmith push in your YAML, fo YAML file with the steps. It was super easy. Um, and I have my my CloudSmith repository. I also have my Bill Kite um, agent running locally. <clears throat> OK. Let's do this. I'll start with the node package, OK? So I have my, my node project here. I'm going to go into my Bill Kite steps. We have, we install node, we install the CloudSmith CLI, and um, I package up my node package, which does, I'm sure, nothing, and I'm, I push it to CloudSmith. It's super simple to set up. I've actually put everything on one line, like because I'm terrible. But if you, if you if you're doing this properly, you would separate these things out, and you can use uh, Bill Kite's temporary artifact storage to push it, uh, push your build package to you before you send it to CloudSmith. So let's kick this off. Okay, when, when it's it's going off there, I'll show you around CloudSmith. So here I'm going to push this, um, push that node package to this repository. I have a few packages that are already here at the moment because I want to demonstrate multi-format repositories. Multi-format repositories allow you to store artifacts of different formats in the same place while still maintaining compatibility with all your native product types. So you can use your like your package manager, your your node package manager and say npm publish or your docker push or whatever. They all those native tools all work against CloudSmith. And they all all the formats live happily here. That means you have a single repository and a single set of processes for managing, sharing and controlling your software assets. You lose absolutely nothing when it comes to functionality. I think most software teams use more than one language and like so more than one format. <laughs> there's there's usually some, some JavaScript in there somewhere. Um, and if you, you have like microservices, you, you could have a good few different languages um, in your the one project. But even if you write all your software in one language, you might use formats like Docker or Helm for deploying and managing software in the cloud. So um, it's really customers love multi-format repositories because it's quite different from other package managers, which make you store your formats in um, like a, you'll have a Maven format and NPM format and never the two shall meet. So um, <laughs> let's see if that's built. OK, great. Our, my node package is built and um, you can see it's extracted out some of the, um, the metadata from that node project. <clears throat> This package has been signed, and um, the version number extracted from it. And you can see one of the dependencies. This node only has one dependency. That's like, where is it? <laughs> it's like quite unusual for uh, a node package to just have one dependency. But um, it's it's uh, all that metadata is surfaced to the developer here. It's great. So I'm going to run my Python pipeline now. Similarly, similarly enough, I have my um, the steps are here. I've built my Python wheel and I push it to CloudSmith. Now you can see here I've used the the CloudSmith push, uh, so that's the CloudSmith CLI. But I could have um, used pip here instead. But you know, next time. Um, let's run this out now. Okay. Oh gosh, I don't know. <sighs> <laughs> it well, it, it builds the no package. I don't know what happened there. Okay. Okay, so we're building our Python package, and while it's building there, I'm going to just show you some cool things about CloudSmith. You can if you can upload your package here. You can upload any of these different types of formats. The latest one that we um, introduced is P2. I think it's for Eclipse plugins. So if I go to Python, 
you can actually, if you've, uh, you're you packaged locally, you can push it up using this web form, but we're all about automation. And CloudSmith generates these contextual documentation for you to, um, to use. So it's super handy when um, using, trying to publish something, you can always go back to this documentation. So it shows you here how to use the native tools to publish a Python package. Or you can use CloudSmith CLI. Now, so I'd say my Python package is published now. So we have our Python package published. Again, you can see all this metadata extracted. All the signing and the checksum information here. It's all good. And just to go back to the multi-format um, idea, like you could set up, if you, you're thinking about how would my repository look? Well, CloudSmith lets you create unlimited number of repositories, so don't worry about being limited that way. You could set up your repositories by environment. So say you could have a develop, a staging, and a production environment, um, or you could set it up by project or by, if you, if you like the format, if you like to set it up by format, you can do that. We wouldn't stop you. We're sort of unopinionated in that way. So a common practice would be ha to have a develop staging and, and production repository. And then um, as you, you might, your develop might have all the upstream set up, but you might not want to have that against uh, production. And you can, um, you can run scans against those packages that are published to develop. And you can check all the checksums before you're happy and publish up before promoting them to production or staging. So that's CloudSmith and how you might set up a, um, a pipeline with Bill Kai and CloudSmith. So I think now, Mel, you're gonna, I'm going to stop sharing. And oh, and now I'm going to attempt to share. I know. Ooh. Let's see if I can do that. I mean, I did practice it, but you know, when you have like eyes on you, can you see my screen? It's loading. It's looking good. You can see the right screen. You can see my build kite pipelines. Yes. Not my CloudSmith notes. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always like, I'm no one should, should see my Slack. cheat. Yeah. Or my Slack account where I'm like, oh, I have to do this presentation. <laughs> um, so thanks, Kira. That was cool to see those two in action. I I already I learned stuff. It was good. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give people a sneak peek of like something that we have in private beta, which is a new product or a new suite of tools called test analytics or test insights so to give you insights into your tests so we're really excited we have some early access beta, beta customers and it's still in pretty active development right now but here's a sneak peek because we're all here so this is what a build cut organization looks like um, just out of um, for example and of course build cut uses build cut <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, we'll Clayton uses Clayton. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so all this, very meta, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is the new test analytics um, tab that would appear if you were signed up. And you can click through to, so this is the BuildKite application's actual RSpec test suite in test analytics. So um, there's some neat graphs. We all love the graphs. Uh, it tells us about the amount of executions over a particular period, and we know this is slow, and because it's under active development, the speed of the thing is a thing that we know we have to fix before it goes to public beta, and that's really, really slow. It's not even loading. Okay, well, there you go. See, it's beautiful. <laughs> oh, there yeah. it is. Yay, and you can see, which is quite alarming, the reliability of our test suite is at a pretty low 38.37% uh, over a 14-day period, which is very interesting. And if you scroll down, you can see this uh, beautiful depiction of recent runs. And the funny story is that when 
Bill Cut first hooked up their um, test suite to test our links. They thought this uh, actual graph was broken. And they were talking to like the front end developer and the visual designer going, something's wrong here, but actually this is reality. This shows how many failures. I don't want to know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's <really> yeah. <laughs> we don't want to know. Back away into the hedge. Um, yeah. and that's it. That's true. This is factual. Um, recent runs, red obviously indicating a test failed and then the build failed. Uh, so you can see these are the latest runs and a run is generally like the time a build has happened in relation to some sort of merge request or pull request or, yeah. Uh, yes, so let's look at one in particular. I wanted to find this really good one that I saw because it was like, yes, we've all experienced the pain of integration tests, but I think they've been working too hard and now it's been bumped down. Here, this one is, oh, no, it's green. That's not the one I wanted. Yeah. There was like a good one that was like, ah. Oh. I remember when I was a developer, I was always turning off tests and forgetting to turn them back on again. I would I'd turn off all of them. That's terrible. I know. Like I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit we had like a, a smoke test that was like testing third party payment integrations or something in their sandbox environment. And it literally, the whole time I was in this team for two years, never passed once and I, I i remember when i first joined i was like oh my god the smoke test failed and everyone's like oh yeah don't worry it always fails and i'm like why is it still a thing then <laughs> i don't understand <laughs> um yes so he can see we've clicked through to a particular run or like a build and you can see it was a merge pull request on this particular branch you can see it was failed this is the build char and then you can click through to the actual build on um, build kite. Uh, and then there's some handy stats. You can see that uh, the total executions were up by 110 in um, compared to previous 25 runs. You can see that the total duration was up by 16 seconds, which is you know, neither here nor there. We have some alerts and you can actually set up your own alerts via settings and you can set thresholds to be alerted so you can say let me know when reliability over the last seven days drops below 95 percent and i think for what i see is the use for this is obviously if a t particular test is um constantly flaking out you can set a threshold that you're comfortable with and then you can easily identify this is a flaky test so it's it's documented it's a thing you have to fix it or you actually should prioritize fixing it. And I think we're working on some integrations that you can click on the alert and then it could potentially open a story or a card in your tool of choice, whether that's Jira or Trello or whatever, and assign it to a person to fix or work on. If you look down here, you can see which failed test, uh, which test failed. Um, and you can also see a list of the slowest tests on that run. And you can see some fancy HTTP timing versus other timing. And I think that's an SQL query. So you can see how much time was spent in a particular test at a very granular, fine-grained level. Um, you can drill into the test suite. And so now we're looking at a particular test file, which is this media objects file. It shows you the actual location of that spec, so you can go into that file and fix it. You can, again, see the reliability. And this one's 94% reliable. That's not terrible, but um, you may think that that's a problem. And you can obviously see the times that this test is run, and you can see these outliers here, which are the failed times. If we click through to that, um, you can, again, see more information you can see that the http request was 16 seconds slower this time the sql duration is up by 297 milliseconds so not probably not a super big concern um, some alerts went off for this particular file and you can also see uh, your slowest sql queries and your slowest http requests uh, and potentially you can tell why this may have failed and, you know, I'm just going to guess that 
is because it's a Selenium test, which is a headless browser test, and my and it sort of timed out there probably because who knows maybe the element wasn't visible on the page, which is a common cause of flakiness in test suites. But I think yeah, the beauty of this um, is that you have insights into your test suite in a way that you never had before. It's kind of like we test our applications in CI/CD. We run our unit tests, but we don't actually know how to test our tests or any or how to improve our test suite. And I think a perfect example use case of um, this in action was that someone in Buildkite drilled into a particular, just one test that failed and saw that it was timing out a lot and went in and fixed the, I think they fixed the SQL query or, or sped it up and it sped up the test by 30 seconds. That's one test. And so I'm thinking like if you multiply that by however many tests you have in the test suite, that's the potential of a huge improvement to the site, the, the, the build time you can see it improve by 10 minutes or something if you think about that. So I think it's a really nice way for engineering managers or developers to set some some goals around this, how they would speed up their builds by drilling into the tests. And that's pretty much I think that's it. There's some tabs, there's, this is the runs, there's the tests, these are individual tests again that you can like look at and go this is failing why is it failing and i think some new some things on the um runway that we're like implementing or working on at the moment is that we have right now we have an rspec implementation for rspec tests which are ruby tests and it's just a gem so that you include the gem in your gem file and it just you wire it up with the token, API token, and it just works. And we are just shipping the JUnit version and we're working on the Jest version. So for all you JavaScript engineers, there will be a Jest version. And when it's actually in public release, we will have APIs, heavily documented APIs, and you are potentially able to roll your own for whatever technology you'd like to use it with. So that is me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and flick over to some slides that are supposed to pop up. Yay! Yay. <laughs> yeah. we were <laughs> the demo gods were kind. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's everything I have. And I think we have some time for some questions. Um, yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So we did receive just a few questions. Um, this first one is for Kira. Oh, they me? Ask, okay. Yes. <laughs> they ask, can you share more about distributing software with CloudSmith? Oh, yeah. Um, so CloudSmith is built on um, a CDN infrastructure, content delivery network. We have points of presence all around the world, over 200 odd points of presence. Um, your, your packages and your metadata is cached at the edge so that whoever needs it, whoever's close it, gets it much more quickly because it's closer to them. <laughs> Don't make me explain it more than that. And <laughs> as well as that, we have like authentication at the edge for the packages. And some of the package managers are super chatty, like Maven and Nougat. And that would make it that would make a huge difference. It means you don't have to go back to the source uh, infrastructure. And it just makes it quicker for distributing packages. Oh, also, just if you are distributing packages to like customers, third party customers, well, you can also have a customized web page so they don't see like CloudSmith, they'll see your logo and all that kind of stuff. And um, we have a way of giving out tokens to third party people outside of your organization called entitlement tokens. So we have a lot of stuff around distributing to um, customers. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so Mel, I think this one is um, aimed at you and they ask, what's your biggest differentiator from other CI CD tools? 
Uh, yeah, so I think uh, I kind of touched on that earlier. It's essentially it is that we are a um, hybrid model where we provide as much or as little um, assistance guidance to you as you need but essentially you're in control of the infrastructure you are res well, not responsible you can control the agents infrastructure how they scale what cloud provider you use uh, and also the fact that you can slice and dice however you'd like you can use terraform you can use cloud formation you can use gcp you can use aws you can use um, on-prem Mac machines for Mac builds if you decide that's a thing you want to do. It's like however you choose is your, it's your decision in your company's decision. And on the flip side, we have our uh, hosted, op the hosted um, components of our service, which is the build UIs, the way you view your pipelines, um, all of those things and a bunch of APIs that we maintain. So it's kind of this split model where we do some of the things and make it easy for you. We scale the agents, uh, the the agent APIs, and guarantee their uptime. But you are also responsible and have ownership over the infrastructure. And most people like that model. Well, outstanding. Um... Real quick, let me run through our Amazon gift card winners before we close out. Um, so the four winners of our $25 Amazon gift card drawing is Asish M, Shannon R, Chris H, and Johan or John K. Congratulations to the four of you. Oh, Keep an eye on your inbox. I think I know that card. Shannon, that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, she Congratulations, works. Congratulations, so Shannon. Well, well done, Shannon. Well deserved. <laughs> but nice. if you don't receive that email, check your spam folder. Yeah, it could uh, be only it's not another sure. Shannon. Poor Shannon will. will do. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fix. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank um, you so much, Mel, for today. It's been really lovely working with you. I can't believe we did like a joint presentation, even though you're in Australia and I'm in Ireland. Yeah. We managed it. We <laughs> And it was a that's a PDN. Is that a PDN? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's been awesome. Thank you. And thank you, Cody, as well. So it's been Thanks, great. Cody. Of course. Um, a quick reminder that today's session was recorded. So following this webinar, uh, our audience will receive a link to access the on demand. And um, you'll also find it living on the DevOps website. Just visit devops.com slash webinars and it will be waiting for you. Um, so again, Kara and Mel, thank you again so much for taking the time to put together this presentation, this demo. And I'd also like to thank CloudSmith for sponsoring today's presentation. My final thanks goes to you, our audience, for being with us for the entirety of today's presentation. This is Cody J. Brown signing off. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Mm -hmm.